So we're just going to quickly review the main points from the first week. Everything was revolving around the convergence of a sequence of real numbers. We had this definition, which you should have annotated as you see on the screen here. Um, in particular, we pointed out how you might want to restrict epsilon values to be kind of small. I had you do that on the first lecture to try to annotate that. It can just help avoid some technical problems. Basically, if things work for small epsilon, they have to work for large epsilon. And then we also find it more convenient to typically let little n's be greater equal to capital N. So while this is the precise uh, mathematical definition, we actually find it more useful as mathematicians generally to write everything in the shorthand, which I recommend as a good exercise, write it out once or twice a day, separate it in time, and make sure you're always writing the same thing. So this is the shorthand definition on this screen. I have all the parts underlined that go into a proof. So you want to write a sequence, S sub n, that's a subset of the real numbers, converges if there exists a real number, S. And so that may or may not be specified when you go to write the proof that determines whether or not the first step of the step zero is optional in your proof. But given that, whether you've provided it or it's provided for you, uh, S sub n converges to that number uh, if for all epsilon greater than zero, so this is the first non-optional step in the proof, there exists a capital N such that for all the little n's greater than or equal to capital N, the absolute value of S sub little n minus S is less than epsilon. And so I would really make sure that you write that out uh, until you're writing it out like five times in a row on separate days and it's always the same and it's always this. It's always this, there's no variation in that. This is the definition you want. And a big point of emphasis is that the capital N, you know, we had this in terms of describing the step uh, in, the, in the proof, that capital N can depend on epsilon. We see this in figures because capital N determines how far out in the sequence you might have to go until all the terms in the sequence uh, starting at that point or beyond are within an epsilon distance of the S value. So these were kind of the, the really big main points that we were making in the lecture, in the first lecture. And then I showed the five-step proof or, you know, four or five-step proof for a couple of examples, like one over n converges to zero. And we keep seeing this repetition of the steps. If step zero um, is required because you're just asked to prove something converges, then you just state, I'm going, basically, we use the third person plural in math when we're writing, so we say we. It's, you're really writing about you and the reader. So there's always a plural, there's a we. You are guiding the reader through what you're doing. So we'll prove one over n converges to zero, and then we let epsilon be greater than zero. You just always write that, and you always get the points, no mistakes there. And then we have to choose capital N. Look, it's a function of epsilon, just as we were talking about. And this is an optional thing, uh, you know, explaining the relationship of then epsilon in terms of capital N, but it's really useful in saying kind of the last two subparts of step four that you do, and it's just setting the stage for that so there's kind of no mystery about where you're going. So you want your proofs to be clear. Um, this is not required, but it sure adds a bit of clarity and ease of read to the proof and a, a great clarity in how you get to your final uh, step in your argument. So there was this typo in this other example, but I'm not gonna go over it. There's just these steps. And then we worked through some other examples and we showed, for instance, like one over three n plus one converges to zero. And we did our scratch work. And this is where we found, for instance, in the scratch work that if, since we're only considering these indices of our sequence, we're, we're assuming that we're starting at one, but we're saying that we're going to choose all little n's greater than whatever capital N we find, then we kind of want to make sure our capital N is greater than zero. So when we go through the scratch work, we find, you know, I basically need little n to be chosen so that it has this relationship to epsilon. But then I see, well, if I chose epsilon kind of large, like 10, then 1 over 10 minus 1 is going to be negative. And then that, I, I might be saying that I'm choosing little n's that are negative, and, and that's just silly because we're not allowing that. Now, there's not really a problem with this sequence, but if you had a sequence that was like one over three n minus three, and you said, uh, well, 
I can't even start this sequence at n equals one. It's not even defined. This sequence only makes sense if I start at n greater than or equal to two. But then you're allowing like n equals one or zero or other things. You go, boy, I actually need to have some restrictions so that I'm not saying that I'm choosing values of n for which this term is potentially undefined. So that, that's all. I mean, it, it, it may be seem a little nitpicky to try to enforce this, but it just shows you're paying attention to an, a subtle detail that has some relevance. So it, it's good exercise to, to, to do that whenever you need to, just to make sure that you're keeping the little ends within the domain of the function of the sequence, whatever indices for which it's always defined starting at some point and thereafter. So anyway, we go through the same steps of that. Uh, we had this divergence, we skipped that. We'll come back to it later. We went through a few things in 7.3. You know, we start really realizing all the works in the scratch work. We again saw, for instance, like with a sub n, that with the scratch work for it, that we get this relationship of little n that says that the epsilon should be less than one. So similar as what we saw before. And by the way, I know there can be some discomfort and this type of implications, what we're doing, this is scratch work. It's actually not meant to be technically correct. The way that you actually have to think about it is uh, a little subtle. I haven't mentioned this in class, but the direction of these implications is you're really saying uh, the way to interpret this is the following. If I have this restriction, then the one above it would be true. So it might actually be more technically correct instead of using the implied in this direction as we're trying to figure out inequalities that get us to this one because that's the inequality we have to prove. But the, the way we're figuring it out is we're saying, well, I'm, I'm in my scratch work, I'm going in this direction just to work things out. So this is maybe a bit of sloppy notation. Uh, it might be better to actually use this direction because what you're really trying to get is some sort of restriction that then implies all of these other directions so that things are correct when you go through your proof. So, you know, if that seems confusing, maybe don't worry about it so much now. It'll, it'll make more sense later. Uh, hopefully that maybe helps for some, I think there was some confusion about how we justify going from one step to another because some of these are not actually implications. They're more like, if this inequality holds, then this one holds, and this is the ultimate one we want to have hold. So that, that's all I'm trying to say there. So uh, the scratch work for um, 7.3b made a really good point, and we spent some time talking about that, so I'll just circle it here again in purple on the screen. And we saw, you know, to, one of the things we get is like, I'd really like to drop the absolute values, and so this actually makes the point of the reverse implication I'm at. In order to drop the absolute values, I can do that if n squared is greater than three, because then everything is non-negative. So kind of, if this was true, then certainly that step is true. So I'm trying to get to where I, I, I want an inequality that's easier to work with, and then it implies this one, which would imply that one, which would in turn imply the one that I actually need. So I, I, that's the direction of kind of the logic you're working with. You're trying to figure out how do I simplify things in a way that makes my life a little bit easier. Okay, switching back colors to the purple. So, we see, okay, well, I only need to make ends kind of so large and then I can drop the opposite values and make my life easier. Then I just do my algebra, I, I isolate the little n, I solve for it, and then you actually observe the inequality that you need in order to work backwards holds uh, for any choice of capital N that's based on a value larger than that, because epsilon is greater than zero, which means that, that you have the inequality that if little n is in fact bigger than six over epsilon plus three square root of that, then it's actually greater than square root of three, which means you can always drop that absolute value when you go and do your simplification at the end of the proof based on the inequality that you ultimately want. So anyway, I hope, I just wanna stop here, kind of say, this is just intended to help you when you're doing the individual homework. If you had some questions about motivations of the directions of the work, I'll try to create more shorter videos that in, uh, summarize some of the key points from a previous week's lecture and post this stuff up, especially if it adds any clarity to discussions. So that's it. Enjoy doing the homework.